Thank you for choosing to watch my talk, From Infrastructure to App Deployment, Where Does a Platform Start and End? I'll start with a quick introduction. My name is Paula Kennedy. I'm COO of a company called Sintasso. We make an open source framework called Kratix, which aims to make life just a little bit easier for platform engineers to build a developer-centric platform. Our code is all on GitHub. It's open source. So if you want to take a look and give us some feedback, then we'd love to hear it. So diving into my talk, today I'm going to be talking about what a platform is. Then I'm going to try and dive just a bit deeper into what a platform really is and cover some common platform patterns. I'll offer some suggestions of what good could look like for a platform. And I'll cover some boundaries of responsibility for teams and parts of a platform that you might want to consider. So part one, what is a platform? This is my favorite platform definition. It's from Evan Botcher in 2018, and I quote it quite frequently. He said, a digital platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support, which are arranged as a compelling internal product. Autonomous delivery teams can make use of the platform to deliver product features at a higher pace with reduced coordination. Now, I like this definition for lots of reasons, but it is a lot of words. So I searched for a simpler definition, and I found this one from Gartner that basically says a platform is just a product that serves or enables other products or services. Very simple. But let's be honest, we're in 2023 and we're at PlatformCon. So it feels like probably we've all got a good idea of what we think a platform is and definitions are quite boring. The good stuff really happens when we try to build platforms. So let's take a bit of a deeper dive. What really is a platform? Now, I said in my talk abstract that I wouldn't say it depends because that's quite a classic consultancy answer, but really it does depend on your context. Your platform and how it looks can depend on lots of different things. The size of your organization, the skill set of your teams, how much technical debt you've got or legacy software that you're trying to manage. There are so many areas to consider when you're looking at how to build and manage an internal platform. A platform can be just as simple as an internal wiki, which has guides and steps telling people how to deploy software. Or it can be as complicated as weaving together multiple cloud providers, vendor provided solutions into a patchwork covering thousands of application instances across different availability zones. It could be big, it can be small. I myself have been in the platform space for quite a long time and my team and I have talked to lots and lots of people in platform teams. So we've seen some pretty common approaches and patterns all with pros and cons. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of those now. My team also published recently on our blog an article that covers this in more detail, but I, like I say, I'm gonna cover just a few. So our first pattern is tickets. Regardless of what your underlying platform consists of, it's a very common pattern that the way teams interact with the platform is through a ticket. It's quite commonly Jira, but I'm not picking on Jira. The good news in this pattern is that the workflow can be quite customized for your organization. You can customize what fields a application team has to complete and that information gets passed to the platform team. The bad news is that the work to fulfill those requests is quite often slow, it involves manual work and can be quite error prone and because of the time delay teams might often look for ways around this process. Another pattern that I've seen frequently is giving teams, application teams, access straight to the cloud provider and treat that as the platform. Now the good news is that the, the big cloud providers tend to have lots of services available and they're on demand so that folks can quickly get access to the services that they need. The downside is that these services that are available are not necessarily the ones that your organization needs. You are at the mercy of that cloud provider. There's no customization for your organizational requirements. And also this can get quite expensive very quickly if there's no checks on what the teams are spending. Another pattern we see, particularly as Kubernetes is becoming more and more popular, is that it's a common pattern to give Kubernetes straight to the developers. Now, the great news for that is Kubernetes has a very nice API. I'm a big fan of Kubernetes. Nice API and a huge community behind it to provide support and answer questions. But the downside is Kubernetes itself is not really a platform. It was never intended to be given straight to developers. It's quite a low level starting point. And by giving this straight to developers, you're really asking developers to then navigate their own steps towards a platform, which puts a lot of cognitive load and effort onto those development teams. Now, your internal platform may have one of those patterns or more than one of those patterns uh, or other 
patterns and approaches that you're taking. But really, where your platform starts and ends is kind of up to you. I was recently described in an interview I did with Jen Riggins uh, as Madonna, because I was doing the Vogue where I said, your platform is going to sit somewhere between infrastructure and application deployment. But really, that's accurate. And how deep down it goes or how high the abstraction goes needs to be tailored for what your organization requires. An important lesson that I've learned in more than 10 years in this platform space is that there's no one true platform. There's no one size fits all. Your platform needs to fit your organization needs. But a good set of platform characteristics that you could aim for include having a platform that is customized for your organization, having services available on demand as far as possible to get speed for your developers, and a clean and consistent API so that your teams aren't having to learn different commands for different things. They've just got one consistent experience that gives them a lovely developer experience. So given all of that, let's take a look at some other areas that can be considered when working out how to handle your platform. Some ideas for what good looks like. If we refer back to the Evan Botcher definition, he mentioned the platform should be a compelling internal product. So in other words, it should be treated like any other product where the platform team should understand the needs of their customers, the teams that are using the platform, and then they should gather the feedback, build just enough to be able to get more feedback, measure that feedback, and then learn a classic build, measure, learn loop to make sure that the platform that is being built is the right platform, is going to fit the team's needs, and it isn't taking the model of build it, and then they will come, and then nobody comes because it doesn't meet the needs of the teams. It's really just, this is the heart of having platform as a product, making sure you have a product mindset applied to your platform. One good way I've seen to do this is really through very close collaboration, at least at the beginning. So I've seen where a product team and a platform team come together and actually do a value stream map. So actually try to map out the time it takes to go from a development team having an idea to it being deployed into production, all the steps in between. And by doing something that looks like this, they, the teams collaborating together can look at, are there steps in the process that are unnecessary and could be eliminated altogether? Are there some steps in that process that take time, unnecessary amounts of time, or are being blocked that where that constraint could be eased? And by the teams collaborating together, it's possible to look at how to make deploying to production faster and smoother so that both platform team and application teams understand that process and understand and empathize with each other's requirements. Another thing I've seen we've done really well is for the platform team itself to have a, a mission statement and a public roadmap so that other teams understand what the platform team is there for, what they're trying to achieve and how they're going about it. So I Googled some platform, some kind of common mission statements and I found this one, uh, which I liked actually from American Express. I like the fact that it's very customer centric and says, they want to become essential to their customers by providing differentiated products and services to help them achieve their aspirations. And I really like that, that customer-centric kind of focus, which could be applied to a platform team. A key question to ask yourself is, can your platform team articulate its vision, its mission statement? And can other teams within the organization also articulate that? Do other teams understand what the platform team is trying to achieve? Okay, so we've covered what a platform is. We've talked about some common patterns and we've looked at some suggestions on ways to improve how the platform can work within the organization. So there's one more area I wanted to cover and that is boundaries. Where does the platform start and end? Now, again, this is all a question, a little bit of it depends. It might depend on what your mission statement is and the type of platform patterns that you have established. But one of the best references I've seen to help guide how you go about this is this book, Team Topologies. So this was a book that came out in 2018 from Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pace. It's a fantastic book. And if you can get your teams within your organization to, to read it, it offers a good com common vocabulary between teams so that people can understand their roles and responsibilities. And it can help to advocate for frictionless boundaries between teams. Now, I'm not going to cover it in too much detail, but I just want to pull out a few key pieces that I think are really useful in this space. So first of all, within the book, they outline four team types and three interaction modes. And 
this is a way to help think about your organization. This might look familiar to you and you may already be set up like this, or this may not be exactly how your organization looks. But really the focus is about having stream aligned teams that are able to kind of own every step of the process that goes from idea to production. And then they are enabled by having a platform team that provides self-service and then having potentially subsystem teams and enabling teams that are everyone focused in the same direction of trying to get flow out of the business. Now, on the interaction modes, they talk about three. There's collaboration and then there's uh, kind of a move towards offering things as a service uh, with like ongoing lightweight collaboration that can continue over time. The book also has very good recommendations on how to apply a team first mindset and guidance on having small long lived teams. So there's a lot of advice in here, but I'm just going to pull out just a few pieces that I think are really, really important. One is about restricting team responsibilities to match team cognitive load. Basically, what you've got is we all know that in the current kind of climate of software delivery is complicated. There are lots and lots of things to consider. But if you can define your team boundaries where the team cognitive load can kind of match, what you're trained to do is avoid having one particular team, one application team or one platform team being overloaded with too many responsibilities and just too many things to think about. So trying to match up the boundaries of the team to the boundaries of the, the work and what they can handle is a good way to think about whether you might need to create a separate enabling team if you want a team to be going out there and doing advocacy of the platform or maybe a separate subsystem team if you have a particular database that everybody is using and it's very complicated you might want a separate team but the way to look at it is making sure cognitive load is balanced another great uh, feature that they mention in the book is about then defining the apis that these teams have and this definition can be who owns which parts of the code base, making sure there's clear documentation that everybody understands and making sure that the experience between teams working together is as seamless as it can be. It's also important that these team APIs continue to evolve because teams needs change, team members change. It's important that this kind of way of defining APIs is kept up to date, is kept relevant so that teams understand how they're working together. And lastly, Team interaction is really important. I've been asked in the past whether this rise of platform engineering that we're seeing is actually going back to dev and ops being separate. And I wholeheartedly say this is not the case, but it is important to make sure that by the platform team aiming to offer things as self-service, that isn't the end of where they interact with their platform team, platform users. The platform team should be aiming to continuously understand user needs, continuously interacting, kind of this lightweight collaboration model to make sure that the platform evolves in line with what their platform users actually need. So to summarize, I've described what a platform could look like and how it needs to really fit your organization. I've covered some patterns for how to treat your platform as a product, having a vision, collaborating with your customers and understanding their needs. And finally, I've talked just briefly about boundaries of platform and teams within your organization so that you can keep an eye on cognitive load and make sure not one team is overloaded and to try to keep a focus on having clear APIs between teams to drive frictionless interaction and to make sure that everybody's pulling in the same direction. I've pulled out just some, some reading materials that I referenced in my talk and I will be around on Slack. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, then please feel free to ping me on Slack or via Twitter or LinkedIn. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening.